is a dreaded topic uh, yes. if it's coming in the exam uh, so i uh, when gurader asked me what we will present i thought i'll take this because i have been doing this uh, with our nbh team for the last 6 7 years so i thought i'll take up this topic yeah so uh, dr inel so before we start just a small introduction uh, all of, all of our moderators are here and okay. uh, sopnil uh, can you start with or uh, we should directly go ahead sopnil if you are there yes sir i am there sir yes. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this i know, will come already late forget the introduction yeah uh, no, i think just two minutes two minutes we'll start good evening everyone all my seniors and all my colleagues so today is 45th educational series on a platform of apollo mumbai critical care learning network uh, and today's topic is quality indicators in icu i uh, welcome uh, our speaker and moderator i introduce first uh, all moderators uh, the first is dr gunadhar padi who is senior consultant and intensive physician at apollo hospitals nami mumbai i welcome dr akhilesh sir uh, who is also intensive physician uh, in critical care department i welcome dr swadeep sen he is also senior consultant and Uh, uh, physician at Apollo Hospitals, Nami Mumbai, Critical Care Department. I request uh, Dr. Gunadhar sir to introduce uh, first our speaker, Dr. Indranil Raut, and uh, uh, I hand over uh, uh, from here to Dr. Gunadhar. It's just a bit fast today because we are already late, sir. Yeah, yeah, well. So basically, today we have a very uh, uh, good, eminent speaker, Dr. Indranil. So he is uh, one of the NBH assessor. So that is the reason uh, he is. Uh, we are very much interested uh, the presentation like ICU quality indicator, which which is one of the benchmarks. i think this is how we compare the different icus and uh, let's hear from him what are the best indicators and how we can improve the quality of our uh, standard of our icu he is dr indranil so he is physician come uh, critical care consultant senior consultant uh, jaslok hospital uh, mumbai and uh, let's we all welcome him to our platform so dr indranil please let's yeah. start good evening good evening uh, thank you for being with this topic uh, gunadhar uh, so icu quality indicators uh, all of us i think are aware of this term terminology because of jca or nbh accreditation and i think most of the uh, 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 corporate hospitals in mumbai are uh, uh, doing this indicators so let us uh, just go through the how how the quality care has evolved over a period of time one of the first uh, documented ev evidence of quality uh, quality uh, control was you know by florence nightingale she actually studied mortality rates of military hospital during the crimean war that was as early as the second half of 19th century and then in 1912 uh, there was a serious code man who developed a method that allowed to study the outcomes of surgical methods to be measured and classified then in 1918 the american college of surgeons they came up with this uh, defined minimum standards that the hospital needs to uh, follow uh, and that led to the foundation of accreditation as early as 1918 in the us Uh, in 1951 there was this creation of joint commission of accreditation or what we call the jch i think many hospitals in mumbai are already accredited to the jch as well as well next slide please yeah so in 1950 uh, the medical audit uh, terminology was coined and you know that the audit started by uh, someone called paul Lem lembach and in 1965 66 uh, there was an establishment of medicare and medicaid federal programs and they were uh, helpful for the senior citizen but what the uh, us medical criteria was that this will be applicable only to the hospitals who will undergo jc accreditation and you see similarly also now that many medical aim companies are telling that they will give medical aim only if the patient is admitted in the nabh or an accredited institute so 1970 williams introduced a new methodology based on the abn what we call as an achievable benefit not achieved so you are studying the standards diagnosis as well as uh, outcome measures and comparing whether the achievable uh, or the desired outcomes were achieved or not then came uh, the famous uh, donabedian sorry can you go to the previous slide yeah so he uh, helped to rethink the concept of quality in healthcare and he classified the method of quality assessment into structure process and outcome in as early as 1966 so the uh, uh, joint uh, commission of accreditation of hospital uh, then of uh, had a system of all centers applying for accreditation to have integrated quality plans for the entire center and this there was a lot of opposition obviously uh, for this but then that led to an establishment of a standard that implemented the indicator me measurement system all over us finally 1990s uh, the jcho developed a system of outcome indicators integrated into the accreditation system 
so how do you uh, what is the methodology uh, for the evaluation and improvement of the quality the two basic approaches room we have to see the room for improvement so identify the problem analyze what is gone wrong and then propose the improvement this is based on uh, w edwards deming cycle of evaluation and improvement which is called the pdsa plan do check and act and then the monitoring system so detect problem we have to detect the problems uh, and uh, periodically evaluate the performance then the fundamental unit which how will do how will we do that is by the indicators so this uh, diagrammatic thing uh, says the same thing that the monitoring system uh, you have to detect and prioritize analyze the causes then define the criteria by which you want to do so design of assessment studies and analysis of action for improvement implement reassess if your desired outcomes are still not there you again analyze what has gone wrong and then carry on that so monitoring system periodically measure and evaluate relevant aspects of the care by means of quality indicators which are the basic unit of a monitoring system and uh, uh, what they require is a uh, you first like you have to de define uh, first be defined by the process of dimensioning and what are the dimensioning uh, aspects of dimensioning establishing the principal care areas elaborating that the indicators will enable the outcome of the healthcare process to be measured so which area you want you want to uh, assess you know like suppose icu or a burn unit or um, something else like you want to assess the uh, admission counter so monitoring to identify the problems situations that can potentially improved or deviations from the standard and what are the indicators they serve to call for attention to this problems and sound an alarm that something is going wrong we need to check ourselves so it is essential that you know in, that the in indicator reflects reality and useful because they are the measurements of the quality so you have to be see that they are they are useful and as well as as real uh, real as possible and not just um, made for the sake of it so the three properties of indicator which is uh, will be uh, if a good indicator will be validity so you have to see when it whether it is actually fulfilling the aim and identifying the situations in the quality can be improved means whether the indicator we are monitoring will actually help us in modifying what is going wrong or whether it really needs to be monitored so that is the validity then sensitivity when it detects all cases in which a real situation or problem with quality of care occurs and specificity only detects those cases in which there are problems related to the quality of care like means you are looking uh, when you are looking at wap and then you are looking whether the wap bundles are followed or not so that becomes specific so what are the steps in designing the monitoring system we have first to define the process then identify the most important aspects then you design your indicators and establish the standards so you have to collect the data tabulate the data and then what do you compare with there may be uh, international or national uh, standard set you compare your data with that and see whether you are achieving those benchmarks if you are achieving the benchmarks fine it's a good thing but if you are not then you have to identify where, where are we lacking where are we going wrong and then improvise on that and make steps to improvise on that so you know suppose for example if you are having a hand hygiene audit and you are not matching the stand, stand uh, you know hand hygiene audit is done in each step of uh, uh, care of hand washing and you identify that in the fifth or the in the fifth process everybody is going wrong like that means after touching the patient or the patient uh, belongings you are not washing your hands then then you need to see and find out how we can correct that so uh, the indicators are uh, will be uh, discussed on the idea this dimension that is the most important aspect of care assessed by the indicator justification why you need that indicator then you need to have a formula like how will you what is the indicator suppose it's a uh, mortality rate so what is the formula how will you calculate because it has to be standardized right you cannot have uh, uh, different mortality rates in different icus so explanation of the terms what like you have to define or how to say uh, simplify the terms uh, for the for the people who are utilizing this then you have to identify the population whether you are doing the mortality rate in the surgical icu in the medical icu or any other um, uh, uh, i would say clinical area how are you, what is the source of your data it's human or it's uh, the uh, his system which is obtaining the data for you so that is the source of data and then whether the standardization so you are um, analyzing your data after uh, at the end of maybe in the time frame maybe a month or yearly or six monthly and then you are comparing your data or the analysis with, with the international or national benchmarks next slide
so there is some you can have some criteria to choose which indicators to employ so there should be the basic aspects of care so you know uh, to uh, suppose central related blood stream infection what steps things can go wrong and that's how you can form a bundle and then see whether the bundle is being followed possibility of risk and then existence of valid and reliable sources of information so who is going to collect the data i mean who is going to monitor suppose we have in our hospital we have uh, we had started a form uh, where when we are putting the lines in the icu somebody will come and analyze this thing i cannot say i have done all the procedures properly so then we had that id nurse who would come and watch us while we doing the procedure we had a pamphlet where you know she would take a checklist you know whether everything is done Actually, in charge and that uh, I used to analyze while we were doing the line. So that's how the source of information is. But for many other things, uh, many of the hospitals here for them to get the information online and uh, maybe easy for assessment also. Next slide. So type of indicators uh, we refer to the classification according to focus of evaluation. So they may be the structure. the damage so what will be the structural uh, the indicators for structure i mean aspects to technological organizational or human resources necessary for care for example technology means uh, suppose um, the uh, what do you say if you have your monitor which is shut down or a ct scan which is shut down so how much was the downtime that would be the technological thing or if you say human resources i mean uh, what is the attrition rate you no know? or that would come into human resources processes that evaluate the way in which the care is delivered with the resources available so you know whether you are following a protocolized approach so if patient comes with septic shock is the egtd being followed or the antibiotic has to be given culture has to be sent antibiotic so you are assessing in the ems itself whether the culture is being sent and the antibiotic is given within the stipulated hour so if you have a set protocol whether the protocols are being implied on so that would be the indicators which would help in the processes the outcomes measure the consequences of the healthcare processes expressed in terms of complication mortality opportunities missed failed circuits etc etc which would again again as an example as the mortality rate which would show that your processes are good or if you are vent ventilated associated pneumonia so how good your bundles are being implied to prevent the vap uh, would be indicated by your vap rate so these are a lot of clinical suggestion you know this is i think coming from the iscm there was one spanish society which gave about 40 50 um, parameters when it it was more clinical you know whether uh, um, your uh, acute mi was thrombolyzed within the window period whether a stroke was thrombolyzed within the window period so that kind of a thing uh, each clinical aspect or uh, the process was studied this is suggested by the iscm like mortality would be a crude or um, uh, severely adjusted uh, severity adjusted disease based what is more hospital so three different types of mortality we can then morbidity incidence of accidental injury intubation accidental extubation delining pneumothorax while putting a line and all nosocomial infections would fall into this next slide cost effectivity so what is a patient and icu day cost to the institution then what was manpower cost so this is all more of the uh, admin or the this issues monitored here safety is the most one of the most important in prevention of uh, um, uh, complications in the hospital so uh, identifying um, uh, adverse events in the hospital made like medication errors and reporting okay that would be uh, following the safety then blood component therapy whether it, uh, any reactions to the blood or whether appropriate components are being given or not you know so even whether we are giving platelets and the right indication will also fall into this whether we are using whole blood or pack cell would be included in this then what about uh, broad spectrum antibody like what about your um, antibody program you know whether we are de escalating uh, early de escalation is going on or not so all this would come into the safety of the patient next slide please uh, of course needle stick injury and uh, any injury during work would come into the safety Uh, man power of course whether you having um, appraisals are given on time the staff is satisfied or not would we'll come in that then resource utilization what is the length of stay in the icu um, average ventilator days then equipment utilization downtime as i mentioned next slide please 
okay and then finally the customer satisfaction so one is the our patient and relative whether they're satisfied whether they have been talked to so uh, uh, whether their complaints have been solved okay so we have to take the feedbacks so that also becomes an important indicator next slide okay so uh, quality of care in medical practices in general and critical care is a responsibility of care provider so clinicians involved are morally and ethically bound to enhance the quality of care given in the in our units and uh, why do we require this quality management because we have to judge the appropriateness and effectiveness of our therapies in critical care and this are the thus the quality indicators will help in achieving the following objectives the quality of the service offered so whatever you are giving whether it is appropriate and it is helping the patient or it is causing harm to the patient results of intervention and treatment undesirable outcomes that means our complications you putting a central line you caused a hemothorax or a pneumothorax so undesirable outcomes and other managerial and treatment related processes so it is becoming nowadays mandatory for the institution to monitor um, the quality indicators parameters to compare the performance level with local as well as national and international bench uh, standards and uh, the indian society of critical care and its executive body meeting in 2008 took to took the initiative to identify some quality indicators for the iso so let's go through them one by one the possible units for benchmarking were different icus like you know uh, medical icu neurological icu neurosurgical icu and the bench also would be different for each icu next slide please let's go to the next slide yeah so very various parameters for the quality assurance in icu in which the uh, this indicators are studied are so mortality so mortality would mean the smr we'll come to each one then the morbidity parameters so an atrogenic pneumothorax incidence of acute renal failure in the icu in the non cardiac icu then decubitus ulcers or a bed sore the operational process length of stay compliance to protocols and readmission to the icu error in patient safety so patients fall rate medication error adverse events sentinel events needle stick injury and reintubation rates and infection control would be the three famous wap uti clapsi and even an ssi which is not mentioned here uh, human resource overall employee satisfaction and customer focus patient satisfaction so these are the seven headings in which the issm made this uh, quality indicators so let's first uh, look at the mort uh, mortality that is a standardized mortality rate so we all would say okay mortality rate is the number of deaths in the icu and the number of patients we treated but it is not as simple as that because that would vary from patient to patient depending on the severity of their illness and suppose you have a terminally ill patient so what uh, so they are not necessarily the indicators of the performance even if those are referred to so so what the smr does allows comparison of actual performance of the institution with the predicted performance based on the average mortality as ex expressed by the national and international data so what is the rationality of this is that the risk of death varies with as i mentioned severity of age disease and comorbid condition and crude mortality is therefore not a sensitive indicator so what uh, uh, what they do is they calculate the predictive mortality from models such as the apache saps and other uh, severity scores and then they compare it with the actual mortality so what is an smr can you have can i have the next slide so what is the formula for calculation of a standardized mortality rate so risk adjusted mortality equal to observed rate upon risk adjusted expected rate so observed rate is what is actual death in the icu so if you have three deaths in this month okay and then you you have a um, uh, what is it process where you are capturing using some score it may be any score where you are capturing the scores and then based on that you are predicting okay this is going to be the this was the expected mortality for that icu so you if the ratio is equal to 1 or 100 that means you are you are uh, this is you are falling in good average i mean it's a good uh, good care so it's supposed to be good care if your ratio is more than 100 at which means the hospital hospital's mortality rate is higher than the expected average mortality rate and if it is less than 100 that means your expected your actual rate is less than the expected average so higher smr however does not mean that necessarily mean that the hospital is unsafe as this is a snapshot method and simultaneous assessment of other quality indicators must be so for like give an example recently uh, we had a young lady uh, who came up with uh, multi organ failure and uh, jaundice and renal failure and all those things and hepatosplenomegaly we were strongly thinking of leptospira but initial leptospira was negative and in uh, space of 48 to 30 72 hours she died so when i was evaluating uh, the smr for this month i realized that her um, apache score was hardly 
I think 14 or 16, which makes the mortality to less than 50%. You know, the predicted mortality for Apache 2. We follow the Apache 2 score here for this predicted mortality. So, you know, looking at her, she was so sick. But this parameters for the Apache 2 would have specific, like, you know, the PO2 FI2, which was not bad initially. The creatinine was not, it was, I think, 1.6 or 2 when she came in. So, um, by the Apache scoring, or the, 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 the scoring was only one probably. So that way her score was not going high, but she died. So no, were we um, wrong? Um, and did we manage her well? I don't know. But you know, late, retrospectively after her death, we got the history from the relatives that she had been on an alcohol binge for three months. So such things may be missed and not always all these indicators would mean that, yeah, yeah, what you're doing is wrong or what you're doing is perfectly right. You have to use it with your uh, precision. Next slide. So this is quite clear, heterogenic pneumothorax related to procedure. So it is associated with a lot of mortality and morbidity, you would agree. And especially in the COVID scenario, if you all remember, uh, pneumothorax was almost catastrophic whenever it occurred. Uh, so it is quite simple, the formula, the number of pneumothorax upon the number of cases into 1000 and benchmarks. So benchmark is 0.83 per 1000 cases. Next slide. So incidence of acute renal failure in a non-coronary ICU unit. So, uh, we will have to first define what you will be defining by the acute renal failure and non-renal. So, wherever the renal, uh, any acute renal failure requiring renal replacement therapy or when the urine output is less than 200 ml per hour or when the azotemia or the blood urea is more than 84 during the patient's ICU stay. Now, here, why this has been taken up is because if there is a renal failure, the mortality increases to almost 60%. Uh, whether the renal uh, replacement therapy has been initiated or not. And that's why this parameter has been included as an indicator. And in even a modest increase in threatening level from 0.3 to 0.4 increases the risk of death by 70%. So what is the formula for this? Uh, number developed, number of patients who developed severe renal failure upon number of patients managed in the ICU into 100. Now here, we'll be excluding the chronic renal failure patients. You're just taking the acute uh, renal failure here. Okay, now this is an age old, I mean, I remember in just look, uh, probably about 10, 8 to 10 years back, we were monitoring only this as the quality indicator and uh, our um, quality department, there was one lady who used to come in uh, once a week and just ask for bed sore. That's it. Uh, so, uh, from there on, now we have come a long way uh, as far as and there is, I think, a lot of more scope to go and uh, go further. So just coming back to the decubitus ulcer, everybody knows what is, uh, decubitus ulcer is and uh, it does uh, imply um, uh, poor care. You know, if the patient is coming without a bed sore and in the ICU, uh, we are giving a bed sore and you know the implications and mort morbidity with associated. Suppose you, one and two is fine, but if the patient gets a um, grade three and a grade four bed sore where you, you can... Uh, have you can have uh, what of increases the hospital stay and the cost to the patient is terrible if patient gets a stage three bed sore. So uh, it is one of the premier most uh, morbidity indicator or the care uh, reflects the care process in the ICU. How will you count it? Number of pressure ulcers come on the number of cases into thousand. So. Uh, with this um, monitoring and quality indicators and all, definitely over the years, I mean, I've, I mean, in one center only for last almost six, uh, 17 years in one ICU. So I've seen a lot of progress when we started monitoring these indicators, uh, especially this bed sore. Um, we are almost close to less than 1% uh, every time when we, when we analyze for our NABH. So definitely, I think... Uh, monitoring and having a dashboard of this indicators does help and does motivate the uh, staff to do better. Okay, now let's go to the operational parameters. Length of stay, please get back to the slide. Length of stay. So uh, total hours and days patient managed in the unit with midnight bed occupancy is more accurate. So what is the formula? So, you no know, length of stay means if the patient stays longer than what he needs to stay, which means either our processes are not good or we are being too precautious. And it also means probably we are not uh, confident that our floor facility is good. So uh, that's why our length of stay may be high. At the same time, if our length of stay is short 
and our readmission rate is high. That means again, that means you're not taking your decisions properly of shifting the patient out. So how do you calculate that? So total occupied bed days upon number of patients in a given frame of time, it may be over a week or a month or a year. So length of stay is often used for uh, is, is for different for different people. The, the benchmarks are different. Like a surgical patient will have different, a CABG patient will have different uh, LOS and a medical patient will have a higher LOS. So um, next is the compliance to protocol. So what I was coming to was about the length of stay was many times um, uh, the length of stay in open ICU and a closed ICU becomes difficult because you know the uh, sometimes the consultant uh, would like to ship the patient early and uh, the intensivist knows that the patient is not good enough to be shifted. And then uh, I think you have to be firm because when the patient comes back readmission uh, within 48 hours, again, it's a indicator of the quality of care in the ICU. And then the ICU team is sure that, oh, you people have not shifted. So we should have discharge and admission protocols. And they also uh, they can be modified from time to time. And we, we should assess whether we are really following the protocol. And even if it is an open ICU, I think if there is a senior intensivist who uh, talks to the consultant and says, OK, I don't think it's fit to be shifted out, then they most of them would listen. And this complication of readmission would be prevented. Okay, so just because you're talking of the protocol, compliance to protocol, just go back to the earlier slide, Gunadar. Yeah, so compliance to protocol is another indicator. So if you have protocol set for the ICU, then you need to, uh, why, why do you actually need to do this? So compliance to protocol, guidelines and treatment bundles are expected to improve patient care. So compliance of protocol could be absolute non-compliance, partial compliance. So the, what is the formula? Number of times followed upon number of times expected to follow. So the easiest example would be the hand hygiene protocols, where you know at each step, uh, one, two, three, four, five, we analyze our, our ID nurses do a wonderful job. And you know in every uh, infection control uh, committee meeting, they present a wonderful graphical presentation. And many times it causes an embarrassment because you know it's usually uh, the doctors who are in the worst category many many times uh, that you know the hand wash is not done so uh, so this compliance would suppose your um, uh, vap rate or your is high or your crv rate is high then you very well know if you you go back to your hand hygiene and see that the hand hygiene compliance is poor you know why your infections are occurring more so that's why the uh, the compliance protocols also needed to be audited next slide so I just spoke of this with the length of stay. So readmission rate is an important indicator. Uh, readmission to ICU is monitored whether it is occurring within 24 hours. So uh, a zero admission rate reflects, it would also mean, suppose you, are, you have a zero readmission rate in six months. It also means that maybe you're overprotective and you're not uh, sending the patients and they're, they're completely, completely all right. But uh, also, if your readmission rate is high, that means one that it could mean that you are a bit premature in sending the patient out, or your ward care is not good enough, and that's why the patients are coming back within 20, uh, 24 hours. Error in patient safety profile. So, uh, patient safety is an important uh, component in all hospitals, and even the when you when the NABH assessors come, I've, I've seen that they're more um, help bent on patient safety and other things. So uh, one of the indicators of patient safety is patient's fall rate. So, you know, patient fall in the ward, I can still understand, but in the ICU is really, really embarrassing for the uh, unit heads and the ICU heads, uh, because if that really reflects a poor care in the ICU, the, the patients are falling down uh, from the bed. So untoward event which result in the patient coming to rest unintentionally on the ground or on the lower, other lower surface. It could be accidental, anticipated or unanticipated physiological. So how do you measure fall rate equal to number of falls upon number of bed days into 1000? Okay, now medication errors. So uh, medication error is, is the one, one of the commonest errors which occur not only in the ICU but in the wards. Medication error bit at all levels. Firstly, in your prescription, whatever we write, then indenting error can occur because you wrote something properly, but the sister has indented the wrong. Drug. Secondly, administration. Thirdly, administration. So you've written correctly, sister has indented the correct drug, but the uh, while administering, she has given it wrongly. 
So administration errors can be like, you know, she's given at the wrong timing, she's diluted wrongly, like the amphotericin B was not diluted in 5% dextrose or the quadrant was not diluted in 5% dextrose. Um, nowadays with our sepsis and all, we like to give antibiotics or prolonged infusion. The sister gave it as a bolus. So all these things would bounty the administration errors. Now, uh, if you just see that medication error occurred at a mean rate of 19% in hospital. So, but a lot of medication errors go un unreported because uh, uh, the fear of penalty. So what any hospital or unit should always encourage reporting and assure that the uh, neither uh, the, the person responsible for the error should not be punished for the same. At the same time, the approach should be as a system we need to change, not the person, because the person may be doing a medication error because there is a fault in the system. Now, suppose the sister is not given the antibiotic for three hours, Maybe there was a fall, uh, there was a problem while she was intending the drug. Then maybe the pharmacy was not having the water by to send the drug to the ICU. So it's not always a fault of the sister. And that's why the system, whenever we identify errors, it should not be individualized penalty. It should be a system change. And we need to identify the flaws in the system. Maybe the sister was overworked. She was doing a double duty. And that's why she made an error. Maybe the doctor on duty was doing a 24 hour shift and he made an error in the judgment or he wrote a wrong drug instead of writing the correct spelling or the so medication error rate is the number of errors and the number of bed is into 1000 so if we ex even if we exclude you know so nowadays for the nabh purpose they're even monitoring whether we have written in capital whether we have written per oral whether we've written iv then they don't like the trade name they want us to write the generic name like you know merofic or meronem will not do it right meropenem so if that way if you go the medication error are lots but if we exclude those then also a lot of errors are going unnoticed who is looking at interactions so what is recommended is that we should have an not only an ICU, uh, icu clinical pharmacologist to help us uh, identify the drug errors and all these things a simple thing as you know uh, the omeprazole you know which cannot be crushed and given through the rt was pointed out to us when we started having an ICU pharmacist. You know, we were crushing when an RT patient, we were crushing the omeprazole and giving it, but the, the, the purpose is not solved. So we have to give a omeprazole sachet and not a omeprazole tablet. So um, medication errors, I think any ICU unit should be closely, closely monitoring the medication errors. Next slide. Adverse events. Uh, so common ICU errors are related to treatment, procedure, ordering. So adverse event would cause, uh, it would mean a med medication error. Uh, even a, uh, what do you say? Um, suppose you are giving a hot water back to a patient and patient gets a burn. It's an adverse event. If you're giving quadron uh, through the peripheral vein and you get a bad thrombophlebitis, then it becomes an adverse event. Okay. And the worst adverse event is a sentinel event where it might cause severe or grievous harm to the patient or even death to the patient. And near misses where a serious harm could have occurred, but you you record you uh, found it out in time and you stopped the event from occurring. So usually a uh, near miss is under tip of the iceberg, and uh, if a uh, lot of errors are being underreported, so you should always when there are near miss proportion is high, that means your something is going wrong. So how do you capture the adverse events? Adverse events upon error rate, that is the number of error upon the number of bed days into thousand. Okay. Needle stick injury rate is from the safety perspective of the staff. Uh, and uh, I think a uh, lot of us now are using uh, those, when we're putting IV cannulas, we are using those uh, where the, once you are out, it'll form a hub and uh, we are not supposed to cap and all those things, all of us know. So, uh, because needle stick injuries can cause deadly diseases like HCV and HIV and HBCG, uh, you have to monitor as it's an important indicator and the incidence per thousand many punctures has to be measured. Okay, coming to the reintubation rate. So uh, again, it applies to the ICU strongly. So reintubation within 48 hours of extubation is, is, is an important uh, indicator of morbidity or even mortality sometimes. So it can be accidental or it can be uh, what do you say, uh, anticipate uh, or, or elective in the sense that we have asked for an extubation and probably our judgment went wrong or something new occurred and the patient had to be reintubated. So, uh, so the number of reintubation upon the number of patient extubated into 100 is the reintubation rate. 
so often we are scrutinized uh, i uh, gone through many nabhs and you no know, while we present the data suddenly that nabh assessor will ask you oh ye month mein zyada tha now you know we wouldn't remember that in suppose your nabh assessment is in december and then january why that patient got uh, reintubated why your reintubations were three you never know sometimes you have given a trial of extubation suppose as a copd patient in borderline so you would probably give a trial trial of extubation to such patients on trial to bipap and all those things so there sometimes uh, things are acceptable but if a routine uh, surgical patient is there or uh, and you extubate and you have to reintubate then there's bad accidental extubations like patient pulls out the uh, et tube and that warrants a reintubation or if your endotracheal tube gets blocked by secretions i think those are not uh, or your uh, your tube slips out accidentally and then you have to reintubate i think those are not acceptable ones so the para indicators of infection control i think all of us know that and all of us are doing it so one is the ventilator associated pneumonia uh, in us i think people have started suing the hospital uh, for getting vap uh and uh, that's how the uh, vap definitions have changed and uh, you know that about vat and uh, uh, ventilator associated tracheobronchitis and then finally vap and lot of things and there are surveillance definitions which are different and actual vap definitions which are different so it's a huge complicated uh, definition thing which you can see on the cdc or the idsa website so formula for calculation is uh, patients up uh, with vap you identify upon the uh, per 1000 days of mechanical ventilation or it's actually uh, yeah so these are the signs and uh, all of us know that so i don't want to go into detail of that but uh, surveillance remember that the surveillance definition of vap are different a little different from the clinical definitions so the next slide here yeah. so formula okay now coming to the crvsi so another important uh, aspect of the uh, infection control in the icu um, its description is blood stream infection rate number of central line related blood stream infection per 1000 central line days so let's uh, if this is quite old this guideline was in 2009 so at that time imagine there was 26250 deaths per year in the united states which is a huge huge amount so we have to and i think after that lot of bundle and uh, lot of improvement in the rates are there uh, in as far as the central line infections are concerned again uh, formulas have kept changing for definition of crbsi and uh, again i don't know whether they are again related to the dynamics of uh, uh, litigations for hospital acquired infections uh, some of the characteristics are relaxed like suppose you already have an infection uh, before coming to the hospital not crva say but any other and then you get a, a line related to crva or you already have an infection in the body in some other place and then you grow something from the center line it's not considered a crva so so all those things have lot of nitty gritty in the uh, formulas are there but the simplest the formula is simple it's identifying the infection which has become difficult so means proving that this was a crva is because the formula is simple number of center line associated blood stream infections upon number of center line days into 1000 there are a uh, lot of international benchmarks which you always compare uh, and oh, then our management says oh this in the the, the crbs rate in your icu is very high you people are not taking care but at the same time uh, many of the international guidelines are based on optimum care so you know uh, the nursing patient ratio is excellent there and uh, we always should not get depressed when uh, when we see our ratio our uh, indicators are not matching to international standards because we should compare it with the way the way we are staffed the way we function so if you are not able to give a one is to one per sick patient then how do you expect quality care so even uh, though the ssm is not included that that is also nurse to patient ratio working hours in the icu those are also important indicators i think which in the long run uh, will be um, uh, included as a pre predominant indicators for care in the icu the last yeah so utis yeah so urinary catheter related infections uh, number of utis upon number of catheter days in 1000 Uh, in our hospital, we have bundles laid down for CRB, CI, for VAP, and you, you know, uh, UTI or POTI uh, all over the hospital. And our ID nurses identify uh, 
this rates and they keep a track of especially the catheter bundles even on the floor each and every catheter catheterized patient uh, is assessed uh, nursing care is assessed whether they're giving the we like our they're giving the catheter pair in each in shift and uh, so that means we are monitoring two things we are not only monitoring the rates we are also monitoring the bundle care and in fact in our icu chart we have the vab bundle as well as the crbs bundle in our icu chart itself so making things easier for them okay so as compared to human resource uh, so uh, the indicators uh, such as the staff satisfaction um, is also important whether you have staff staff attrition rate suppose your staff is repeatedly leaving for whatever reasons which means that you know you are going to have new staff to train and uh, they may not be as for till the time they are trained they, their functioning may not be as optimum they may not follow all the quality guidelines so attrition rate is an important quality indicator in the hr area next slide yeah. so overall employee satisfaction so um, satisfaction level of staff work in the hospital or the unit and if the staff is satisfied he is going to give you a better um, uh, care to the patients and better outcomes to the hospital so and if the satisfaction is high you retain more staff so formula for calculation on a 1 to 5 point scale where one represents lowest satisfaction and five indicates the highest possible satisfaction customer focus so ultimately whatever care we are giving is it are the uh, patient and their relatives happy with the care and um, that's how we, I mean, one is our our clinical indicators and one is this so whatever you have done i mean all patients are not going to come and die and are not going to be critically ill some of them are just going to come post op for one day in the observation and if you if the relative is not satisfied with the care given the information given sometimes patient even the cancer patient you know is so many lily is going to die but if the family is not ha happy the way we are giving the end of life care the way we are taking care of the patient then they are never going to rate your hospital properly and they are not going to come again to your hospital so customer satisfaction is an important part and that is also becoming an indicator for the care in the icu so formula for calculation you have to convert do surveys you know each hospital has even consoles now to give survey in in our um, ice uh, in our icu there's a pro who every patients when he goes out of the icu they give a feedback form and that that's how they uh, evaluate and again as many times they give a score out of 1 on 10 and then various aspects doctor ne baat kiya ki nahi have you been attended by the maushi or the uh, ward boy and all those things are given and then the ratings are then food forms an important part of the feedback uh so customer focus or patient satisfaction and relative satisfaction is one more quality indicator so what are the limitations and concerns with our indicator so a uh, lot of stress has been given on mortality morbidity infection control and uh, so acceptability and utility of this parameters in this indian scenario will have to be assessed i guess this this whole article was uh, in 2008 and a uh, lot of hospitals have evolved and i think everybody uh, almost all the good corporate hospitals are incorporating all these clinical indicators on the day to day basis as i told you earlier diagnosis of ap is controversial the clinical and the as i told you the surveillance definitions are different or slightly different okay then somehow uh, in our country compliance to protocols have not been even more important in fact many hospitals just have protocols for the sake of it but the protocols are not being followed sometimes protocols may be difficult to follow in an open icu because for example i'll tell you in one of the hospitals five different cardiac surgeons had a different antibody to give as a prophylactic uh, antibody before the surgery so how do you deal with that then uh, some institution may have reservations in sharing the database due to lack of logistic support many institution may find it difficulty in generating regular and meaningful data so if you are not adequately staffed your like you require somebody to monitor all this right like suppose your quality department doesn't have anybody you just one person then how are they going to capture data you can't expect your sisters to do everything next slide so uh, basically we also need to have our nation, national data we are just always comparing with international data like i as far as i remember for the nab which we just uh, uh, always uh, uh, comparing with the international benchmarks 
So when we uh, register our data each hospital and then send it to some national registry, like in NABH, I think uh, we'll have our own data and then we'll have a benchmarks first to compare at our level and then compare with international. Okay. So uh, just to conclude, quality indicators act as a yardstick to measure the level of care afforded in a unit over a period of time. Variation in care in the unit and among different units with similar case mix can also be done if indicators are compared on a regular basis. Quality of care in ICU depends on complex interaction between patient, machine, and care providers. Process-driven and protocol-based management should eliminate the ambiguity and ensure better outcome. Such approach is not possible unless care is provided is quantified and gap between current level and desired level assessed followed by improvement initiatives uh, taken to bridge the gap. Selection of indicators and monitoring the same, therefore, should be considered as the most vital and challenging task to bring continuous improvement in the performance level of the unit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Indranil. Uh, so, can I stop this sharing slides? Yeah. Okay. There's one more slide I want to share. Just, just go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so this is slide. So, the objective of having standards is to raise them. I feel this was an important, uh, very nice uh, sentence by this gentleman. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I fully agree with it. Basically, the, the main purpose of the quality is to measure it and to improve the standards. So that is a famous quote, like if you don't measure something, you cannot improve the standards. Yeah. So you, as you rightly told, the uh, measurement is very important. For measurement, we should have sufficient, adequate, uh, you know, the manpower, yeah. the uh, proper uh, statistician and uh, the quality team who should lead the organization. So my only two, one or two questions to you, like you have attended a lot of uh, this NABH uh, assessment in many of the hospitals, in your hospital also, yeah. You're working almost for last 17 years in just low. So what are the minimum uh, standards and criteria the hospital has to follow? And what are the minimum standards the intensive care unit has to follow uh, for the NABH uh, benchmarking? And uh, apart from NABH, there are other lot of international accreditation body like JCI, and yeah. uh, those also like our hospital is just accredited. So what are the what are the things one should be very much aware about, like our junior intensivist? So I think uh, our hospital yet is not applied for the JCI, but you know JCI are more stringent than the NABH. But uh, the only thing, uh, sadly, many times uh, uh, we do keep a tap of this monitor, the, the, this indicators which are presented in meetings. They are well taken care of, but many times. Uh, uh, a lot of things are, uh, I think they are done only when the NABH is about to come. So that is uh, what is the sad part. Then I find that the reporting is very bad. I mean, very, very under reporting, especially medication errors. So uh, at least I think we cannot take care of the ward, but uh, in the ICU, we should uh, make a system where fearlessly the medication errors are being reported so that we can improvise on them. Uh, in drug interactions is quite neglected in the ICU. So that uh, I think is a predominant thing. Which, as far as the infection control parameters, of course, it is utmost. And I think um, at least in our hospital, uh, the bundles are being followed and regular assessment is done. And I expect, I mean, I'm sure all the uh, JC accredited hospitals are doing the same. But as I told you that many hospitals, they buck up only when the accreditation is due, you know, unless three months things are done. Uh, I, at least in our hospital, I have not seen uh, the data, at least which is going from our ICU or from the infection control team being manipulated for the sake of NABH. I don't know about the other data, but at least from these areas, I have not seen any manipulation. And we are being honest, yes, but the error reporting is still under quite under reported. Right. So, what I want to give uh, emphasis on this, like, uh, the, what I request all the uh, intensive care practitioners who are uh, out here. So the most important benchmark what the JCA has laid actually for the international patient safety goals. So there are there are six international patient safety goals. I think they should uh, go through it. And they have uh, very clearly and elaborately actually written all the steps what are to be followed for the nursing care personnel and what are to be followed for the doctors. I think that uh, care bundle is there. I request all of them to go through. Yeah, there are those six safety goals and each component of each. And again, I think majority will have, uh, again, errors, medication errors and all coming into that. Patient care, again, elderly, the, what do you say, the vulnerable uh, patients and all those things. So it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, we, in fact, every year have this patient uh, safety goal week where we, our 
uh, any uh, i mean the quality department organizes games and uh, what do you say uh, even memes on all over it so i think yeah as you rightly said that thing has everybody should know and follow i don't know how much how about fire from the exam perspective the patient safety goals uh, but yes i think so sooner or later somebody will uh, put that in the exam as a exam question also how about fire safety yeah, yeah, goals yeah. <laughs> those are now uh, fire safety goals are being followed because without that the hospital is not getting a uh, license so they are strictly followed even the older hospitals have to get it our hospital is making a complete lift we are you know it's a, it's a 20 bed hospital so for getting that fire safety uh, uh, license they have built a two huge lifts from the outside just for the fire safety norms so that that is quite uh, government is quite tough about it now yeah see as far as these uh, transcription errors or prescription errors or you know dispatching errors which are very very common so there has been lot of emphasis on reducing these errors but uh, probably you know every hospital struggles to reduce uh, these errors okay i know manpower is also one, one, one more issue training is also another issue and there are errors which are happening at every level right from the doctor prescribing the medication to the uh, sister indenting it and then the dispatch from the pharmacy to everything so whether it is jci i mean we have been in jci it is the institution so we have seen in spite of having rigorous training programs and in spite of having rigorous you know surveillance programs you know with the training and everything these errors have not been reduced So, what is your take on this? I mean, uh, can you throw some light on this because these are very essential and very important. No, no. So, again, as I said, it has to be self-motivated. So, if I, so if I am the uh, in charge of my unit and uh, I underplay some of the medication errors myself. Then, then how are, how do I expect others to do it? So, unless you identify the errors, and as I said that. the approach should be systemic systemic improvements uh, or system failure not be treated as a individual failure whenever we find detect errors and identify adverse events it, it, the system has to be modified not individual as because most of these medication errors you may know you a new comer must be doing it suppose so have we trained him adequately how to write the prescription or you know the uh, uh, as i felt you know when when the nba started our verbal order thing stopped or um, you cannot write it on the regular paper where we write our notes so the 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 even if suppose i see the patient as a consultant and write okay i write injection meropenem to given eight hourly now until somebody writes it on the drug sheet the system may not follow it even if it means the going the antibody going late to the patient so i think these are some pitfalls of all this uh, systems also the jci or the accreditation uh, nabh and all so somehow we have to balance uh, 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 strike a balance so But there are... how 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 is the reporting errors in uh, medication errors in your hospital is it adequate or you feel it's under reported uh see there are there are two thing one is uh, like uh, reporting system uh, still need to be improved uh, but the capturing of data of course uh, it is most of the data you can see the 90% 99% compliance we have but sometimes you know there sometimes lot of there are lot of because of lot of attritions nowadays because of the yeah. staff and other persons sometimes the presentation of the data or sometimes the analysis of the data may not happen sometimes many of the times but uh, uh, fairly uh, as a jci accredited hospitals most of the things are at place and uh, it's up to the mark so there there are there are there are one or two questions like uh, somebody has asked what is your smr in your hospital in just look and what is the collapse rate so uh, our collapse rate is always uh, following the international uh, benchmark even less than 1% but uh, smr does go above 100 i mean more than one the ratio the, the more than 100 and that's what i said ki this this month itself our uh, smr is more than 100 so uh, as i told you this case where the apache score was only 14 or something and still the patient died so this things do happen and uh, yeah at least is an eye opener previously we used to say okay hamara mortality rate to acha hai lekin when we assess that the patient whose apache score was less has died then it opens your eyes you know why did this patient die so 
when i was assessing this for this month that that patient of 14 apache score died so i have taken that case for the mortality morbidity meeting so maybe something will throw up in that ki what went wrong in the patient so be the quaternary or tertiary tertiary setups we tend to get lot of report patients who are already yeah, treated yeah. outside so we get very sick group of patients so it is very highly likely possible that quaternary or tertiary setups are likely to have yeah, but what other that's what no we feel that they are bad but when we suppose we go by only by the scoring system clinically our judgment may be different but if we go by only the scoring system sometimes the scores are not actually high because that yeah. scoring system follows only particular criteria yeah. so you know if you see apache 2 i don't know about apache 4 now map of map of below 60 60 to 70 more but where have they mentioned norad suppose a patient is coming from an uh, outside as well as you rightly mentioned he is coming on 5 ml of norad abhi wo 5 ml norad pe the bp mein in the map may be good then he is not but he is in shock we know that he is in shock so there are this fallacies in this uh, systems also so so that is the reason most of the times now this smr actually is uh, going out of the uh, box in many of the western countries yeah because there are a lot of uh, fallacies in collecting the data a lot of uh, uh, fallacies in interpreting the data and uh, when your numbers of admissions are more and uh, if you are collecting a data which is less than the number of admission sometimes you find because the mortality remains same your smr automatically goes up like the case you have highlighted Yeah. and when sometimes in a sick patient young patient where actually the apache scores are pretty low but patient is actually clinically sick you looking at the initial yeah. days of illness and if he or she dies then that also you can find the falsely elevated smr actually so that so is honestly if you see apache where does it see inr where does see liver enzyme so it is not taking liver into account at all i mean of course their liver cirrhosis is considered as a comorbidity but uh, uh, you could have a well compensated liver cirrhosis and a non decompensated liver cirrhosis for both the apache score will be different but it, the apache score has not included liver enzymes or inr or albumin right and as you rightly told like it is not only the one indicator which will gives you the absolute yeah. value for your hospital it should the overall you know the interpretation of many indicators which are interlinked and that should be the benchmark for that particular hospital i interesting thing i read while uh, preparing for this was you know what they said that the error uh, rate was more you would expect the error rates to be more when your icu is busy but interestingly they found that the error rate was more when your icu was less occupied absolutely okay so the reason one of the reason but they said that when your ic was more occupied you were too busy probably to report errors secondly they found that the ad adverse events were more when your ic was busy because you are probably so that's how things work so still i have only uh, something uh, yeah sorry the yeah, probability is still uh, whatever indicators in ic the error we can uh, use them to anticipate the things yes. even if they have yeah. lots of fallacies but still we can have lots of of course of, uh, of course yeah 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 lots of anticipation and so we can are, uh, consistently having a crb say rate which is more than the benchmark then you definitely it's an indicator that something is going wrong we need to see whether our processes are wrong where we are going wrong i mean i mean to say we should not get biased with the score we should always uh, forget with the clinical thing and then we have to anticipate what is going on this is gunadesh uh, sir always uh, tell us to anticipate the things what is going to happen and that act, uh, act accordingly so that just point reminded me yeah that is individual but suppose as an uh, how do you out, like outcomes kaise like how do you know what are your crbsa rates abhi usme until you do it over a periodical basis you will not know how your because we always feel ah, yes, definitely rate. yeah and a very important persistent, point uh, 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 persistent chasing will be needed to have that uh, all the indicators even if uh, anything is missing we can correlate clinically and we can always have those uh, anticipation in our uh, uh, cards yeah, yeah. and uh, this uh, like uh, the important point by dr giris like system thinking should start it's the system which is problematic and not the individual so whenever there is any problem right is rightly told by you also we should uh, try to improve the system and and uh, not to point out at a single individual uh, at that point of time yeah. so i have one question dr indran is probably i mean there is lot of human try pertaining to the antibiotic consumption you know 
even the restricted antibiotics are being yeah. consumed yeah. a lot and there is education being implemented or advocated probably and then you know we have antibiotic stewardship programs anti fungal yeah. stewardship programs in place and still in spite of having these robust uh, you know surveillance programs and measures we have not been able to reduce the antibiotic consumption so do you think Current system will help us, or any kind of. I know the system has to be evaluated well and thoroughly. It has to be revamped, and probably everyone has to be brought on page. The education of the consumption, the physician. But I think, as far as ICU is concerned, uh, closed ICU would help us for antibodies. Yeah. Open ICU, I don't think it is possible. And open ICU, it is possible only if the management supports you. So even in closed ICU, the problem sir. the same I mean, well given example when we started our uh, antibiotic stewardship and you know we had this form where if uses we made a form where this this 10 drugs were used there was long back and uh, then you have to give a justification like there was a column where it was empirical based on evidence and this thing uh, as per the culture report and then if you have given uh, not according to this why you have used it explanation so uh, and if the explanation if the form was not filled within 24 hours uh, the pharmacy would withhold the drug okay so there were many consultants who would fire the md are how can you stop my patient not getting drug my patient that my patient mar jayega the will you take the responsibility then obviously management is going to take a foot back a step back so but what should be done for this because there has been indiscriminate usage of antibiotics and we are already facing the antibiotic resistance issues and we don't have any drug available a new antibiotics are also available but in this situations what should be the stance of the clinician like you being an intensive care head and then your I md think, is also uh, you know see, see you both have also been uh, uh, you both also have been working in apollo for a long time so uh, if senior people like us uh, take a stand and take an effort extra effort and speak to the consultant and try and convince them i think it will make a difference because if our uh, juniors do it maybe they will not listen but probably if we pick up the phone and talk to them and reassure them that this is not required maybe that's the way we can do it because all this stewardship form and everything i we tried everything it's difficult because then they feel they feel like you know if there is an afro consultant transplant patient transplant likha to then you get the license to give everything but, No, we have started this. Uh, What's it actually? No, it has the justification form. And who has and has what justification you have given? Who is going to uh, assess those forms? कि आपका justification करा बरे है कि नहीं? वहाँ पे इसका नंबर. Those writing is also very important because the consultant is never available for writing the justification, and it is his poor RMO which is probably not trained enough to write the justification, and he is filling the form. And then you don't get adequate data as well as whether the antibiotic was justified or not. So probably some of the other senior clinicians only have to take the call on this filling justification form. Then only probably will be able to reduce these issues. So I think with no more questions, uh, so we would like to end the session. So Sopnil, sir, there is one question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it should medications error written in file or separate? Uh, because relative may sue. Any uh, comment, sir? Sorry. Any should, comment on it? Should medication error written in file or separate? Because uh, relative may sue over the. Uh, But medication error. Or who writes in the file? You don't write in the file. Exactly. So we have a separate form online available by the quality team. We fill the medication error and then we send it across to the quality team, which does a uh, RCA over it. Yeah. So this thing is probably not uh, being disclosed yeah. to relative. What, what will you write in the folder? Medication error occurred. Obviously not. You will not write it in the folder. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think we, uh, so till uh, we can conclude the session. So please. Yes, sir. sir uh, before concluding the our session i'll request all of our students uh, to focus on uh, nephro critical care uh, review come uh, review uh, course which will be having hands on sessions and uh, uh, online sessions for uh, uh, important lectures and we are going to provide a, a, a nephro critical care manual uh, which we are uh, ourselves are going to prepare uh, otherwise uh, uh, it will be of three day course uh, first day will be uh, of uh, 
online and two days will be hands on so it will be 20 21st and 22nd of next month so uh, uh, all the details has been given in chat box uh, it's a website of 360criticalcare.com and there they will have uh, students uh, can find all the uh, uh, brochures uh, two days uh, hands on what do you want to do two days hands on what will be there I mean. crt and everything or no it's uh, basically in the two days the first half will be the some lectures okay. and the second half will be like, the machine learning Okay. The CRRT machines, lead and plasma phases, and uh, hands-on for ultrasound guided venous access. The uh, the, the ultrasound, uh, the renal ultrasound, and uh, those kind of uh, things actually troubleshooting. Yeah. So that is. I CRRT also, on ECMO. Yeah. So so I'll also I'll also send you the uh, details. So if you are uh, available, please do join us. Uh, mm -hmm. Be happy and send across all your students because you sure. are getting <laughs> all. Academic program among yeah. the students. Yeah, but we appreciate your uh, academic program. You know, a lot of my students. I mean, uh, I mean, in fact, as I told you earlier, that we even tweak our program because our program was also on Saturday, on Thursday at the same timing. Then uh, many times we were taking our program because your topics are really interesting and good. No, thanks, 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 Thank uh, you uh, thanks, Doctor yeah, Thanks, Doctor Zindani. Yeah. Actually, it's a wonderful talk, and uh, really thanks from our critical care department. And uh, we will like to have you here in the future of so many of our programs. Sure. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you everyone who has attended all this thing. And I request all of students to take advantage. Um, all these recorded videos will get on our YouTube channel, which is already placed in our chat box. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.